Well, everybody, thanks again for joining us for another session of Radiology Grand Rounds with Health for the World. Uh, my name is Claire Kerwin. I'm currently an intern in a surgery program at UCSF East Bay in Oakland, California. And today it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Siedler, who will be giving a talk on ultrasound and CT guided interventions. Dr. Siedler is an associate professor of diagnostic imaging at Brown University. He's originally from Canada and completed medical school at McGill, followed by residency at Jacoby Medical Center of Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He then did his fellowship in body imaging at Brown Rhode Island Hospital. Thanks again, and everybody continue to put in your questions in the chat or in the Q&A function as you would like. And with that, I'll hand the platform over to Dr. Siedler. All right. Um, good morning um, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, can, can everybody, can you see my screen? We can. Okay, good. All right. Great. So today we're going to talk about ultrasound and CT guided procedures. And um, again, I apologize for the, um, for the lateness. So for, for disclosures, I am a partner at Rhode Island Medical Imaging. Otherwise, there's no financial disclosures. And um, here is the um, QR code in the survey monkey leak for those of you that want to get CME credits for this. So we're going to start with the origin of the IR. And the origin of IR goes back to the days of Dr. Charles Dodder, and uh, where he said the vascular catheter can be more than a tool for passive means for which diagnostic observations used with imagination, it can become an important surgical instrument. And that's what IR is all about. It's all about imagination and challenging um, what you can do on a minimally invasive basis. And we want to find newer and more innovative ways of putting imaging and image-guided therapy at the service of the patient. So today we're going to talk about informed consent. We're going to talk about sterility. We're going to talk about timeouts. We're going to talk about solid organ biopsy approaches. We're going to talk about drainage and aspiration. We're going to talk about thermal ablation. So to start with informed consent, um, we always need to provide consent to our patients. We have an ethical and fiduciary responsibility to do so. Um, the patients have autonomy. They have the right to make their own health decisions. And it's our role as physicians to give advice. And it's up to the patient whether or not they want to accept or reject that advice based on all the risks and benefits that we've given them. Um, legal principles um, are based on claims of negligence. And allegations are often based on consent discussion, um, whether or not the consent was adequate or it was inadequate. And many of the liability cases in IR are actually predicated upon the consent process. So most legal uh, actions um, are based on negligence and obviously, as I said, raise allegations about the adequacy of the consent discussion with the patient. And most jurisdictions require patients should be told what the doctor intends to do as well as what the significant material risks are, as well as anything else that a reasonable person that a patient in a patient's condition would want to be told. So some of this is a little bit difficult to you know, know what, what reasonable means, especially depending on who the patient is, but um, that's what the most legal jurisdictions do say. Um, the adequacy of the consent explanation is usually judged by a reasonable patient standard. That is what a reasonable patient in the particular patient's position would have expected to hear before consenting. Most patient care is actually based on implied consent, meaning um, there's no actually written or you know, formal acceptance of what you're about to do, but it's actually implied. Um, express consent can be verbal or written. Um, consent is often implied either by the words or the behavior of the patient. So for IR cases, generally there's three elements for a valid consent. First of all, it must be voluntary. Obviously, it cannot be under duress or coercion. Um, two, the patient must have the mental capacity to consent, uh, meaning they have to understand the nature of the investigation or treatment. They have to uh, understand the anticipated effect of the proposed treatment or the alternatives. They have to understand the consequences of refusing the treatment. And they also have to take, um, we have to take reasonable steps to ensure that the patient understands the consent discussion. And finally, the patient must be properly informed. Um, so all three of those are necessary. Um, the patient must be properly informed um, is, is the most important factor of it. And um, we have to consider what other possibilities can be considered. In other words, alternative forms of treatment and, alter and, and what would happen to the patient potentially if we did not 
um, choose to undergo the, the said procedure. Um, I'm going to skip over this. So minors are a different issue. Um, in many jurisdictions, the criterion for capacity to consent is maturity, not based on chronological age. So in this regard, I probably wouldn't be able to consent for my own procedures because I lack the maturity. No, I'm just joking. But it's based more on maturity, not on chronological age. A child must be able to appreciate the nature and consequences of their decision. Um, you could re report the child to the protection authorities if a parent or guardian refuses a medically ne necessary treatment. In some jurisdictions, the parent or guardian must consent if the child is under 14. Um, and in life-threatening situations, so, you know, in, in a situation with a minor, I recommend contacting, you know, ethic, ethics in your hospital or in your institution, or alternatively contacting Child Protective Services to, to learn more about, you know, the consent process in your specific jurisdiction. So in life-threatening situations, if a life or limb are in danger and the patient is unable to consent, and there's no substitute decision maker that isn't immediately available, you have a duty to do what is immediately necessary. So again, you have to do you know, what you think is right for the patient under those circumstances. Um, you have to respect any known or previous wishes of the patient. So if you, if, you, know, if you have uh, documentation in the medical record that the patient is a you know, do not resuscitate or is you know, pursuing palliative options or is on comfort measures only, the intended treatment may not align with the patient's uh, respective wishes. And um, after I would, you know, after all of the, the procedures done, it's better to obtain the consent after when it's reasonably possible. Um, the purpose of the consent form is, um, is not well understood. Many people think that when you sign a consent form, that means that you actually consented the patient, but the consent form itself is not the consent. It's actually the dialogue with the patient. That's the key element of the consent process. And the, in many um, medical legal situations, they will not actually um, look at the consent form, but they will actually study the dialogue and what was said during the consent process. So the dialogue and the actual process is more important than the actual form itself and the signature on the form. And um, you always have to follow hospital or institutional requirements when completing that form. The timeout is very important. Believe it or not, it's it's just it's extremely important. You have to undergo a timeout process before doing a procedure. We never want to do a wrong side. Uh, we never want to do a wrong patient. Um, we always want to stop before we proceed. We want to um, give um, you know make sure we have the correct patient. We're doing the correct procedure. We've done a time. We've done a verification for the patient. We've done a consent for the patient. We have all the necessary equipment just to make sure everybody in the room is on board. Um, in the United States, we have JCO and, and doing a timeout is, is a JCO standard. So um, now I'm gonna switch over. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the procedural aspect. Um, there's aseptic technique and there's clean technique. And both of those are different. Aseptic te te technique is the method to present contamination with microorganisms. Um, whereas clean technique um, is really reducing the number of microorganisms. So for aseptic technique, we use utilization barriers such as sterile gloves, sterile gowns, sterile drapes, and masks. Whereas with clean technique, we don't, we don't even really need to use you know, uh, sterile gloves. We can use appropriate hand hygiene and just clean gloves. Um, the patient um, and equipment preparation is different. For aseptic technique, we use um, aseptic antiseptic skin preparation, you know, chlorhexidine, iodine, something like that. We use sterile equipments, we use sterile instruments, and we use sterile devices. But um, with clean technique, we, um, you know, we we try to prevent direct contamination of supplies and materials, but um, not necessarily to the degree that we would with aseptic technique. With aseptic technique, we have uh, strict environmental controls. We have to keep the door closed during the procedure. We minimize the traffic in and out of the procedural rooms, and we we try to exclude unnecessary individuals from being present during the procedure. And um, contact guidelines are very strict with aseptic technique, only sterile to sterile contact is permitted. Whereas um, the sterile to sterile contact rules do not apply in clean technique. But most IR procedures use aseptic technique, but sometimes you can use clean technique as well. So now we're gonna switch over and talk about modality difference. We're gonna talk about advantages and disadvantages. The truth is there is, there is no, um, better modality. 
for, it depends on which procedure you're doing. Um, CT may be better for under certain circ circumstances and ultrasound may be better under certain circumstances. They both have their strengths and weaknesses. For ultrasound, the big advantage is you get real-time imaging. You'll be able to see the needle in and out of the, the patient in real time as it goes in and out. Um, whereas with um, CT, um, you're not gonna be able to have that. You're, you're gonna hit the fluoro pedal and you're gonna get one image in a point of time. You're not gonna be able to actually see it in real time. Um, ultrasound uses multi-planar imaging. You can literally turn the probe anywhere you want. You can, you can use any plane. Um, whereas CT, it's more uniplanar imaging. You do not have that option. Um, ultrasound is widely available. It's inexpensive. There's no radiation. Um, now with CT, you know, you get, you don't have that real time imaging with CT fluoro. You, 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 you hit the pedal and generally you have to acquire image by image. We have uniplanar imaging. So there's less of a choice in how you can approach, um, approach a target. Um, the procedural times are generally longer with CT. CT is much more expensive. And obviously there's a radiation um, exposure with, with CT. Now, um, CT procedures are generally easier. It's easier for me to teach a CT procedure than it is for me to teach an ultrasound procedure. It has a shorter learning curve. And um, it's very, it's much easier to see um, and avoid intervening structures with CT. With ultrasound, you know, you can put pressure on the abdomen and you can coapitate the bowel. And you can therefore not see the bell, and you can actually go through the bell because you don't actually see it. Where with CT, you know, you would see, you would have a much more um, um, precise definition of the intervening structures. But unfortunately, we cannot um, we cannot use ultrasound to do all the procedures. Um, patient's body habitus, intervening bowel, sometimes those are prohibitive for doing an ultrasound procedure, and we have to do CT. So we're first going to talk about renal biopsies. Um, renal biopsies were historically done using landmark distances between the vertebral spinous processes and the 11th and 12th ribs, and they were they would palpate the kidneys with movement with the patient in a prone position. This wasn't great. <laughs> there were a lot of issues with that. Um, I remember hearing about cases where you get back pathology and you get colonic tissue from a renal biopsy, and you'd be scratching your head and I'm just trying to figure out how that happened, but. Obviously, it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't easy in the absence of imaging. Um, so pre-procedural workup with renal biopsies, we have to review medical history and medications. Generally, I, only, I, I, I like to only do renal biopsies after urology or nephrology consultations. Um, native renal parenchymal biopsies are done to determine the, the, the nature of the patient's renal dysfunction, um, and therefore nef nephrology consultation is usually indicated. Um, urology consultation may be indicated if you're trying to biopsy a renal mass as well. Uh, for all biopsies, uh, we prefer an INR of 1.5. We, we also want a platelet count of greater than 50,000. Um, recent studies have suggested that an INR of less than two and a platelet count um, of greater than 25 is acceptable, but um, uh, most guidelines recommend 1.5 for an INR count and 50,000 for a platelet count. We also want good blood pressure control. We want a systolic blood pressure of less than 140 and a diastolic of less than 180. Higher blood pressure obviously increases the risk of post-procedural post hemorrhage. We use an 18-gauge core biopsy needle. Um, generally, there's two kinds of biopsy needles, core biopsy needles that you can use. There are, um, there are biopsy needles that use a tray system. So you deploy the tray into the lesion. So the red is the lesion itself. Um, and this is the tray coming out into the lesion. And this is actually where the sample will be obtained. This is actually the, um, the specimen um, a portion of where the where the biopsy material will go into, and this is actually the dead zone of the needle, where you won't actually get any of the of the biopsy. So you deploy the tray, and you can see the tray, and you can see where actually the tray is and where the sampling will occur, and then you fire it, and that fires it into the, it. It, it sh slides this sheath over the needle and cuts the specimen, and then it takes this little the little piece of specimen here into the needle itself, and you have that little specimen. And um, with a with a automatic needle, it actually just fires. So you actually do not see a tray. It actually will just fire out into it. This allows for more, um, you know, if, if you want to use a tray system, you, you're getting more precise control. You can actually know specifically where in the lesion you're targeting. 
Also, you're, you know, you don't have to worry about going beyond the lesion. If there's something outside of this lesion, there's a critical anatomic structure outside of the lesion, the tray could help you kind of um, make sure that you're not actually going beyond the lesion itself. So we use an 18 gauge core biopsy needle usually for renal biopsies. We either do them in prone or decubitus position. And the reason is, is we always wanna stay retroperitoneal when we're doing a renal biopsy. The, the kidneys are retroperitoneal organs. Um, we want to generally remain in the retroperitoneal compartment. Um, if there is a bleed, it's better to bleed in the retroperitoneal compartment. It is, it's a confined space. It will generally tamponade the hemorrhage and stop it from getting out of control. And also, you know, if you're biopsying a renal mass, um, a retroperitoneal approach will allow the entire, um, the entire process to remain in one compartment. So if you're worried about seeding, if you're biopsying a renal cell carcinoma and you're worrying about the unlikely event of seeding, it's very rare, but possible. If you're staying in the retroperitoneal approach, it would be easier to treat um, later on. The ideal approach to a focal renal mass is the shortest route to the lesion that passes through some normal renal cortex. The reason for that is you want to avoid um, causing a bleed and the adjacent renal cortex will actually allow the lesion to, um, to tamponade into the cortex. So if you go through the cortex, the, the, um, the location that you actually hit the, the lesion itself will be tamponaded by the cortex when your needle goes out and decrease the risk of bleeding. The ideal approach for a natal renal uh, biopsy is um, you're trying to go from the mid pole to the lower pole. You're trying to avoid the central echogenic hilum. You're trying to get the cortex, which obviously has the, the nephrons. That, and um, the, the cortex is the money, is where, is where you're going to get the native parenchyma. It's where the pathologist will um, will will we'll study the cortex does not the 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 echogenic hilum does not offer anything in terms of diagnostic value, and you'll you'll potentially cause bleeding into the into the hilum, into the collecting system, and potentially cause um, vascular complications. Given that the interlobar arteries are very prominent in the in the hilum, and you could cause um, larger bleeds and potentially pseudoaneurysms. So here's an example of a native renal parenchymal biopsy. Um, you can see the sag plane. This is the kidney. So this is, um, you know, this is the cranial end. This is the caudal end. And you can see here, we're going sort of from the mid pole to the lower pole. This is the upper pole. This is the lower pole. And the biopsy needle is going to fire into the cortex here of the lower pole. It's not heading towards the sinus. So this is an example of a biopsy that's actually headed towards the sinus. And if it gets beyond this, this junction here and goes into the sinus, you're obviously risking causing um, bleeding into the collecting system and, and big hemorrhages and pseudoaneurysms. So the preferred approach is on the left. Um, the number of passes for focal renal biopsies, um, generally we do two to three core biopsies. That's been at most centers where I've worked at, most pathologists are usually consent with that for you know renal masses. For non-focal renal parenchymal biopsies, the 18 gauge needle can usually get, we can usually do one or two two biopsies. And um, those samples um, are usually sufficient for, um, for diagnosis. Um, you can also look at the specimen for a, a non-focal parenchymal renal biopsy. And you can look at the glomeruli and sometimes you can see that they actually listen. Um, and you can actually learn to actually um, uh, count them yourself. So complications do happen in renal biopsies. Um, the overall mortality rate in a review of more than 16,000 abdominal biopsies was 0.03%. So um, it, is, it is unfortunate, but it can happen. Hematuria is present in approximately 35% of patients who undergo a renal biopsy. And 65% of patients who undergo a renal biopsy generally uh, um, have a perirenal hematoma. I actually encourage my residents and fellows not to look for, for uh, bleeding after a renal biopsy because all, almost all patients will have some blood in the perinephric space. And the reality is I don't know what to do with that if I see some perinephric hemorrhage because it's normal. It's 65% of patients will have it. So um, there's really no point in even looking after the biopsy to, to look for hemorrhage um, immediately after the biopsy. Less than 1% of these patients, fortunately, will require blood transfusion. So although a lot of them are going to have hematuria, a lot of them are going to have these perirenal hematomas, less than 1% of them will require blood transfusion. 
and renal loss is seen in less than 0.1% of cases. Other complications include infection. Um, you can get a pneumothorax if you're biopsying a lesion in the upper pole. Um, you can injure the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, and the colon. And in a renal mass, if you're going for a renal mass, a renal cell carcinoma, I have seen the seed before, albeit it's very rare. Um, here's an example of a CT image showing a solid enhancing mass in the anterior aspect of the right interpolar kidney here. You can see you have the liver here. You could have the, the mass in the, in the right kidney. This is the vertebral body. This is the contralateral left kidney, the aorta. This is the IVC. This is the portal vein. This is the superior mesenteric artery. This is the stomach. So, you know, you want to ask, how are you going to approach that mass? You could, you know, you can do it under CT guidance. You can come like this, retroperitoneal approach, or you can do it ultrasound guided. And um, we can see the mass here with ultrasound. Here's the echogenic mass in the kidney. This is the liver. This is the mass itself. And this is the vertebral body. But, you know, in order to access, access this mass, we actually have to go transhepatic um, under ultrasound if we want to do it, because that's really the only way we can see it without CT. Um, so we actually did it that way. We biopsied the mass transhepatically, um, and we were able to obtain a biopsy specimen. Okay, so be a little bit careful, though, because you're going through the liver. And um, obviously, because you're going through the liver, you're actually taking the risk of causing complications of liver, bio, liver, liver hemorrhage. You can cause bleed in the liver. Um, you can also cause seeding in the liver because your needle has gone through the liver. So little tumor cells can actually seed the liver and they can contaminate the liver, unfortunately. Um, so liver biopsies, um, we're going we're gonna to switch. We're going to talk about liver biopsies. Um, there's two general kinds of liver biopsies. There's random liver biopsies where you're trying to diagnose and evaluate the nature of the patient's acute liver injury, their, their li chronic liver disease. Potentially, they have grass versus host disease, or percent, uh, potentially, it's a liver transplant, and you're trying to evaluate for rejection. Um, for a targeted liver biopsy, you're actually looking at a lesion in the liver. There's a lesion that you've identified in the liver. And you're trying to determine what that lesion is. Is it a primary benign liver lesion? Or is it a liver cancer, a liver malignancy? Is it a metastatic lesion from something else like metastatic colorectal cancer or metastatic lung cancer? So two different um, reasons. There are contraindications to a liver biopsy. Um, an absolute contraindication is an uncorrectable coagulopathy, meaning you know the INR is eight, you can't fix it. Um, the platelet count is 2,000, and it cannot be fixed. Obviously, there would be a very, very high risk of hemorrhage. It's an absolute contraindication. Relative contraindications include ascites. Some people think that um, when you puncture the liver, the liver capsule with ascites, you might actually cause bleeding because there's nothing to actually push on the capsule after the biopsy, and that hole that you've made in the liver capsule will actually result in bleeding outside the capsule. Biliary obstruction is another relative contraindication. If the biliary system is dilated and you biopsy it, you can technically cause a biliary leak through the capsule. And finally, elevated right-sided blood, uh, right-sided heart pressures and elevated blood pressures, similar to renal biopsies, um, also results in an increased risk of bleeding. Um, ultrasound is usually the preferred modality for liver biopsy. The liver is moving as we breathe. Um, it's, and it's, it's easier to keep track of the lesion in real time with, with ultrasound. Um, CT is usually reserved for lesions where we cannot see them with ultrasound or where we cannot really get a safe trajectory using ultrasound. For liver biopsy, we like to use three to five megahertz transducers. Um, for those of you that don't know, a general um, key to ultrasound is that the lower the frequency, the higher the, res the the higher the depth you can get, the more penetration you can get, but the expense of that is resolution. So a higher frequency will give you better resolution, but you will not be able to look very deep into the structure. Higher frequency probes are indicated for more subcapsular or superficial lesions, but most, um, most of the time we use a three to five megahertz probe. So there's different approaches that you can take to access the liver. There's an intercostal approach, um, meaning you're going between the ribs. Um, now, the important thing to tell you when you're going between the ribs, you're always going through the pleura because the pleura is actually coapitated. The visceral and parietal pleura are actually coapitated. 
there's no lung, but there is pleura. So anytime you go through the pleural space or going through in between ribs, you can theoretically cause a pleural effusion and you can also theoretically cause pleural seeding. So if you're trying to access some malignant cancer, you could see the pleura potentially. Um, and furthermore, any, any associated risk of going through the pleura, including pleural effusion, you'd have to consider. A subcostal approach means that, you know, you're obviously going below the costal margin. You're not going an intercostal approach. So there's nothing to worry about in terms of the liver, uh, sorry, in terms of the, um, the pleural space. But um, the gallbladder and the colon are structures that should be avoided. Um, and sometimes that's difficult to avoid with a subcostal approach. And finally, there's a subxiphoid approach, and that's best for targeting lesions in the left hepatic lobe. And the most important um, point in doing a subxiphoid approach is to look for the epigastric vessels within the rectus sheath and make sure that you're avoiding them. So you can use two kinds of methods when doing a, a um, liver biopsy. You can use a coaxial or a direct approach. Um, a coaxial approach means that you're using a larger introducer needle to access the parenchyma or the lesion itself. And you leave the introducer needle in place throughout the procedure. And during the procedure, you, you insert a smaller core biopsy needle into it. And you could take um, different specimens um, by you know, leaving that introducer needle in. And as you put the um, biopsy needle through the introducer needle multiple times, you can take multiple specimens with only making one puncture into the capsule. And there's a theoretical reduced uh, risk of bleeding if you use a coaxial approach. Um, theoretically, it reduces the risk of seat tumor seeding or disseminating an infection because it's only one puncture through the tract and you're going through that tract to make multiple, to take multiple biopsies. But unfortunately, the disadvantage of this is, you know, you really can't sample too many areas within the lesion because that uh, restricts you. You're, you. You put your introducer needle, it's usually a 17 gauge introducer needle. It's usually parked into the lesion, into one aspect of the lesion. And you can't really alter the um, position of that needle too much without causing hemorrhage or, you know, um, shearing of the capsule. So the, the approach itself is we anesthetize the abdominal wall with a 22 or 25 gauge needle, usually with lidocaine. We actually have to anesthetize the liver capsule, Gleason's capsule. And sometimes we have to use a longer needle, usually a spinal needle. And that is actually the most critical part of the um, anesthesia process is actually the capsule itself, itself. Gleason's capsule is highly innervated and therefore um, anesthetizing the capsule will reduce the risk of the re reduce the pain and discomfort during the procedure. So I like to put a big aliquot of lidocaine on the capsule itself. Um, we can use a 17 gauge introducer needle and we can introduce normal background liver parenchyma. Um, and that's key. Whenever you're going after a, re um, a liver lesion, similar to a renal lesion, you wanna go through normal liver, uh, liver parenchyma. And that again, reduces the risk of bleeding. And for a native parenchymal biopsy, when you're trying to evaluate for some sort of hepatitis or liver dysfunction, we only need one pass. And if we're trying to biopsy a lesion to determine if it's benign or malignant, we need two to three passes usually. We obviously need to maintain major arterial and venous branches in the liver. We wanna avoid major branches of the hepatic veins, the portal veins and the hepatic arteries. There are complications with liver biopsies. Um, in a study that was done over 6,000 patients, um, you know, 49 had acute and delayed major adverse events. So that's 0.7% of patients. Um, the incidence of bleeding or hematomas requiring angiographic intervention was 0.5%. So only 34 of the 6,000 patients. The incidence of infection was very low, only 0.1% of patients. The incidence of hemothorax, meaning blood in the pleural space was 0.06%. So very low. Again, those must have undergone a trans plural or intercostal approach. And unfortunately, 0.05% of patients died within 30 days of the liver biopsy. One of them was actually directly related to the biopsy itself. So one out of 66, 13. So here's an example of a liver biopsy. Um, you could see that um, here's the biopsy needle itself. And this is actually the lesion here. This is this big acrogenic lesion. You could see that there's some cystic components or hypoechoic components in the lesion itself. And this is actually the normal background liver parenchyma that we're tra transducing through it. So um, decreasing the risk of bleeding. And there's, there's the kidney hiding out in the background. 
So this is a very high lesion in the liver. It's, it's in the dome of the liver. So this is the normal liver and this is the lesion itself. It's in the dome of the liver and there's lung all around it. The liver, um, you know, the diaphragm actually comes up along the anterior and posterior aspect of the liver. It's very, very high, this lesion. So how are we going to biopsy it? Well, it turns out with ultrasound, with a huge deep breath in, the patient can actually uh, breathe in and hold their breath well. And you can actually see the lesion right over here, very, very high up in segment seven of the liver. And you can see this bright line is the diaphragm here. So you can actually take the biopsy and biopsy this, this nodule under ultrasound guidance. And ultrasound guidance is actually easier in this case than CT guidance because CT, you know, you, you'd hit the pedal and you'd get an image and you'd see this. And you know, you can't go, you shouldn't go through lung because if you go through the lung, you'll you'll cause a pneumothorax. All right, here's another example of a liver lesion going through normal liver parenchyma here. And here's a tough lesion. Now this lesion is right on the capsule. So this is Gleason's capsule and this hypoechoic lesion is, is present. Now, like I said, you should go through normal liver, but you can't go just like that in, into it because if you do, the risk of bleeding would be higher. So what you wanna do is you wanna come sort of on the side of the lesion. So you get a little bit of normal liver and then just take the biopsy, therefore decreasing the risk of bleeding. So now we're gonna move on to lymph node biopsies. For lymph node biopsies, we use either a 14 or an 18 gauge needle. The larger 14 gauge needles are generally preferred if you're looking for cases of lymphoma or lymphoproliferative disorders. The pathologist likes to see the architecture of the, of the tissue and um, 14 gauge is usually what we recommend. For metastatic disease or other processes, we generally recommend 18 gauge. Sometimes you also wanna consider sending for flow cytometry, particularly if you're um, concerned about a lymphoma for, for breast, um, a lot of uh, pathologists prefer 14 gauge biopsies for lymph nodes for biopsies. Um, the way we do a lymph node biopsy is we anesthetize the subcutaneous tissues, the skin surface, and we anesthetize the capsule of the lymph node with lidocaine. And then we biopsy the cortex and we undergo a coaxial or a direct approach. And then usually the, the specimen is placed in formalin for pathological assessment. So here's an example of a left inguinal lymph node. You could see um, an echogenic hilum here, which is normal. If the lymph node is oval in shape, which is normal. And this is the cortex of the lymph node. This is the where you know where the, the you know the pathologist wants to see the biopsy from. So here goes. We're going to put a biopsy needle into the lymph node. And I told you about the tray system. So here is actually the the, the tray where the the specimen will will be taken. And this is actually the dead zone of the needle. And then you could fire the needle, boom, it makes a sound, and there it takes the biopsy. And this is actually the specimen of it for pathological assessment. So again, um, this, this is a tray system. We get the needle, we've got the, the trough, and we've got the sheath, and um, we fire it and we get a specimen. We're going to talk a little bit about a spleen biopsy. Um, spleen biopsies have a bad reputation. There was an older study done, which showed a very, very high risk of bleeding with um, spleen biopsies. And um, actually, it's to me and my experience and to more recent literature, it's actually very similar to liver biopsies. The complication rate is very similar to a liver biopsy, and the process is very similar to a liver biopsy. We anesthetize the abdominal wall and the skin surface with a tiny needle, a 25 gauge needle. Then we um, move to the splenic capsule with a longer needle, usually a spinal needle. We can introduce, use an introducer and um, similar to the liver, we wanna go through normal splenic tissue. We take one pass for a native parenchymal biopsy and two to three passes for a targeted biopsy. And obviously we wanna avoid major arterial and venous branches within the spleen. So this is an example of a splenic biopsy. Here you can see the spleen and here's the kidney and we, we take a biopsy and um, usually there's no problems at all. So we're going to move sh shift now and talk a little bit about thyroid nodules. Now, the crazy thing about thyroid nodules is that depending on where you read, um, thyroid nodules are extremely common. Actually, they say that two thirds of patients who undergo a thyroid ultrasound will have a thyroid nodule. Um, thyroid nodules are often caught incidentally on other imaging, like CT imaging of the cervical spine for trauma and other issues. And um, depending on where you read, um, six to 13% of nodules that we identify will be actually required biopsy, that, that, we, that we identified for biopsy will actually yield cancer. 
So six to 13% of the biopsies that we recommended, of the nodules that we recommended biopsy will end up yielding malignancy. The majority of these thyroid cancers are actually very, very low grade. They're actually what we call papillary thyroid cancers, which are very, very slow growing thyroid cancers. And unlike its malevolent uh, associate of anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is very, very aggressive, um, that only accounts for one to two percent of thyroid cancers, but and all, and, but it, it is responsible for more than half of cancer deaths, whereas papillary cancer is very, very benign. So here's an example of just showing you what's happening um, with thyroid cancer over the last you know 20, 30 years. You could see that between you know the 80s and 2010, um, the um, this represents the population growth rate in the United States, the green line. The base population is growing constantly in the United States, whereas the number of thyroid cancer cases has been increasing. And most of that is actually due to the increase of papillary thyroid cancer. But as you can see, the red line indicates the, 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 the mortality rate from thyroid cancer. And you can see that there, despite the fact that we have been um, you know, diagnosing papillary thyroid cancer exponentially, we have not altered the mortality rate from thyroid cancer because papillary thyroid cancer is very, very slow growth. Here is another study done by colleagues in head and neck showing again, um, the incidence of thyroid cancer dramatically increasing and um, the mortality rate in the blue line, not really changing much. And here are histological subtypes. We're getting papillary, we're getting follicular, which is another very, very low grade benign variant, but the poorly differentiated cancer is not really, we're not really getting more of those by doing more thyroid ultrasounds. So this is an example of a thyroid biopsy. You could see that this uh, practitioner is actually using, um, rather than using aseptic technique, they're using clean technique here. They don't have a probe cover. They're using, they, they, you know, they may not be using sterile gloves and they're taking a thyroid biopsy on a model there. So how do we determine what nodules we need to biopsy? We look at um, different criteria using ultrasound, um, we, these are, there's a different um, risk stratification that we use to do assess the risk of um, malignancy associated with thyroid nodules. It's very important to look at the thyroid nodule and to characterize it because again, two thirds of patients will have these nodules. So the most benign appearing nodule is a cyst at the bottom. You can see anechoic structure, no solid components, no, no septations. We move up to uh, cystic components with uh, multiple septations. This one has a spongy form appearance. This one is partially cystic. You can see a little bit of a solid component. Um, you can see a solid component here, a little bit more solid, but again, some cystic, cystic features. But this also has a very, very low grade of risk of malignancy. These are low suspicion lesions. You can see an echogenic nodule, or hyperechoic, meaning it's brighter than the adjacent thyroid. This one is isoechoic. It's the same. This is partially cystic and eccentrically solid. And you can see partially cystic with an eccentrically solid lesion here as well. And those have a low suspicion, low risk of malignancy. Hypoechoic nodules, meaning darker than the adjacent um, thyroid, not, thyroid gland, those have an intermediate risk of suspicion. And these are all high risk lesions, microcalcifications in the nodule, very irregular margins. We don't like those. We don't like when the nodules are taller than wide. We do not like irregular margins. We do not like extra thyroidal extension, meaning the nodule is actually going beyond the thyroid or bulging the contour of the thyroid. Um, so none of those um, really are good things to see in a nodule. These are the, uh, the, the newest criteria that we use, the ACR TIRADS criteria. The American Radiology developed a scoring system, a point system, in order to determine the risk of cancer or malignancy associated with a thyroid nodule. Um, it's based on the composition, the echogenicity, the shape, the margins, and echogenic foci, meaning calcifications. You, um, you know, you have to choose, um, whoops, you have to choose the, um, you know, what you see in the nodule. There's a point system, and then you, you add up the points, and you get a certain risk, and it tells you what to do. So you can see a, a score of zero is benign, and a score of seven or more is highly suspicious. And um, you know you use these to determine if you're going to follow them, if you're not going to follow them, or if you're going to biopsy them. So we do a thyroid biopsy with a 25 or 20 gauge, 27 gauge needle. Usually it's a 1.5 inch needle. Um, by the way, those are smaller than most um, needles that we use for IV catheters for you know blood draws, blood tests, and peripheral intravenous catheters. So it's a very small needle, very fine needle. 
We usually do two passes if we have a cytotechnologist. If we don't have a cytotechnologist, we should probably do five passes. We don't like our patients coming back for biopsies, and five is generally a safe number. We use a very high frequency transducer because it's you know it's so superficial. We send it for cytology. And other things that we can do is we can send it for thyroglobulin levels, and we can also tend it for genetic testing. Um, most pathologists will actually report these using the Bethesda system of um, a classification system for uh, thyroid malignancy. Um, a non-diagnostic uh, result will actually, whoops, a non-diagnostic result actually has a very low risk of malignancy. Um, and you can see atypia of undetermined significance. Um, follicular neoplasm, suspicious and malignant, obviously going up. And these, these are how they were, uh, they're recorded. And these are the actual um, ranges you can, you can explain to your patient the, the risk of malignancy associated with that diagnostic category. Um, so here's an example of a thyroid biopsy. Um, it looks like it does not actually work on this computer, unfortunately, but it's supposed to show a needle going into the nodule. Um, you can either go laterally or you can go medially into the nodule itself. So we're going to turn now to pseudoaneurysms. Pseudoaneurysms occur um, usually as a consequence of um, some sort of arterial intervention. Um, a lot of times we see them in our department from cardiac catheterization procedures where they um, undergo a radial or um, iliac access to um, do some sort of catheterization procedure or endovascular procedure. And after the patient has a hematoma and um, we do an ultrasound and we identify um, the, you know, the artery in this case, it's the common femoral artery. We identify a neck going to an aneurysm and we identify the aneurysmal sac itself with this characteristic yin-yang appearance, which tells you that there's to and fro flow, meaning that there's blood going into, into the aneurysmal sac and then exiting out of the aneurysmal sac. So there's bidirectional flow in the neck of the aneurysm. And what we can do is we can actually occlude these with thrombin injection. So here's an example of thrombin in being injected into a pseudoaneurysm. And what's really interesting about thrombin is it actually, it actually activates the coagulation cascade. So it actually tells the coagulation system to, to form a big clot. So you actually place a needle into the periphery of the um, aneurysmal sac. So in this case, you, know, you kind of insert it right here. Um, and then you inject a little bit of thrombin and it's actually, it's, it, it's pretty dramatic. You, you, you really need like, we're talking 0.1 cc's of thrombin to inject. And then all of a sudden you're going to see an echogenic clot form in this, um, in this aneurysm. And, um, you're going to actually not get any blood flow after the procedure. You're going to, it's going to completely thrombose the, the, um, the, the pseudo aneurysm and the patient is effectively cured. So, um, very, um, very um, high yield procedure, very satisfying procedure for, for us to do. We basically cure the patient of their problem and send them on their way. Here's another example of a superficial femoral artery. You could see a little narrow neck here. And you, again, you could see the yin yang sign. When you put the um, spectral Doppler waveform over the, the, the neck itself, you can actually see that there's flow going towards the transducer and flow going away from the transducer. So that is the to and fro flow, the bidirectional flow in these pseudoaneurysms. And here again is that yin-yang sign in the sac of the aneurysm, which you should look for. We're going to talk a little bit about prostate biopsy. Um, prostate biopsies are usually done transrectal. Sometimes we can have to do a transperineal approach, usually because the patient doesn't have a rectum. Um, the advantage of a transperineal approach is that there's um, almost no risk of um, infection. We, um, for for random biopsies, we usually do a sextant biopsy, meaning we do six segments, two passes per segment um, using an 18-gauge biopsy. We always want to use provide anesthesia to the neurovascular um, Dr. bundle. Dr. Seidler? And, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to give you a heads up. The session might be automatically ending at eight. So I'll let you keep going, but in case it does just automatically cut off, I think we'll have to have you back for another session at some point. Um, but Great. in case it doesn't shut off, I'll let you keep going. And um, again, hey, thank you to everybody who joined as well. So I'm just going to, before I, I leave, I just want to give you guys my email address. I, I'd be happy to do another section in case, in case, um, let's say in case I. Um, and we can always, I'll pass along your email also. In oh, our, okay. Um, okay. I was going to give you my email. Um, okay. So let me go but back. But it hasn't shut off yet. So you might be okay.
All right, I'll try to be done in about 15 minutes. So, um, you know, it's a transrectal approach. We can use MRI for targeting as well. There's a risk of infection because of the transrectal approach on the order of about two to three percent. Here you can see the, the the ultrasound probe in the patient's rectum, and you can see the biopsy going through the rectal wall into the prostate, taking a biopsy. Um, the one thing that I always like to talk about with prostate um, imaging and prostate biopsies is the PSA test. The PSA test is actually quite controversial. Um, this is um, uh, the 1,000 um, the 1,000 person rule that you can see in the U.S. Preventative Task Force guidelines and also the Canadian guidelines where they look at what happens if 1,000 people get screened. So in this case, what happens if 1,000 people between the ages of 55 and 69 screened over a 13-year period get screened with a PSA and the threshold is three? Well, the majority of those patients, 720 will have a negative PSA test, less than three, so that's great. Oops. Um, but unfortunately, the other 280 will have a positive PSA test and you're gonna have to figure out what to do with them. So of those 280 patients, 178 of them will undergo um, further follow-up testing where we don't find cancer. So that's a huge number of people that underwent unnecessary investigations um, that we did not find any disease. Four of these will actually experience biopsy-related complications like infection or bleeding that are severe enough to require hospitalization. Now, eventually, 102 men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer out of 1,000. Now, out of the 102 men, 33 of them, the prostate cancer would have done nothing. Nothing would have happened to the patient. They wouldn't have undergone, had um, any kind of morbidity and mortality. They may have had psychological stress by knowing that they've had cancer, but it wouldn't have done anything in the long run. And, um, but um, 33 of these will actually, uh, um, uh, because of that, um, they would have just underwent um, the screening and, and the biopsy and the investigations without any, any really benefit. But a lot of them will have complications. 33 of them, sorry, um, you can see at the bottom here, um, for every 1,000 men, 114 to 214 will have the short-term complications of infection, blood transfusions. 127 to 442 will have long-term um, complications, including urinary contents and rectal dysfunction. And four to five of them, the, the very unlucky ones, will actually die from the prostate cancer treatment, not from the disease, but from the treatment. But if we look, of the 102 that are diagnosed with the cancer, um, five of them will die despite undergoing PSA screening. So despite undergoing the screening, they'll still die. But only one person, one lucky person out of 1,000 will actually escape death because they underwent PSA screening. So be very cognizant that a lot of this is, again, overdiagnosis, similar to the thyroid um, issue. And this is an example of fusion that we can do with MRI. Um, sometimes lesions are not really well visualized with, with, um, with ultrasound, but you can see a hypoechoic lesion on ultrasound here that characterizes it on MRI, and you can actually fuse the images and, and um, get a biopsy. So a paracentesis is an important procedure. I'm gonna describe how we do it in detail. Um, like my other procedures, we anesthetize the skin, the subcutaneous tissues, and the abdominal wall with a 25 gauge needle. And the most important part is to really anesthetize the peritoneum. The peritoneum is the most sensitive, most innervated part. You can use a longer needle if the patient has a, a larger abdominal wall. Um, and we use a five French catheter. Um, it's a paracentesis catheter. It doesn't depend which ma doesn't matter which manufacturer. There's a one step, a UE, a Caldwell, a skater, whatever it is. It's a five French catheter, and obviously try to avoid the epigastric vessels and avoid bowel. Um, the thing about bowel that's interesting is a lot of people get worried about it, but if you actually hit bowel, a lot of times the bowel will actually just move away because it's in a sea of ascites. So it's actually quite hard to puncture the bowel. So this is an example of what you'll see on ultrasound. This is the abdominal wall itself. This is the skin surface. This bright echogenic line is the peritoneum. The black represents the ascites, and this represents bowel, this echogenic bowel that you'll see floating in the ascites. And these are the epigastric vessels. You can see that they actually travel kind of along the erectus sheath here, and then they extend laterally into the region of the um, groin. We should try to avoid them at all costs. So a thoracentesis, I tell residents when we're going to do a thora, it's basically, it's a para in the chest. It's, it's similar. We use a 25-gauge needle to anesthetize the chest wall. 
And again, the pleura is the most painful part. So we want to make sure we give a nice aliquot of lidocaine to the pleural surface. And we use a five French catheter. Again, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about the intercostal vessels. I'll tell you why. In medical school, they'll teach you that the intercostal vessels actually are um, below the, the, the rib. And they always tell you you should go above the rib. So, you know, looking at a cross section here, you can see the nerve artery vein and the vein is, and the vessels are below the rib, but that's not reality. Real anatomy, um, the intercostal vessels are actually very tortuous. And um, when we look at them, they're actually everywhere. They're, in my opinion, just as likely to be at the top of the rib than at the bottom. So I encourage residents to no longer look for them for that reason is that they're actually present anywhere in the intercostal space in our experience. Um, here's another example showing the lung surface here. This is the diaphragm, this is the liver, and here's the pleural fluid. So we're obviously going between, between the ribs, between the inferior ribs, and we're going through the parietal and the visceral pleura getting this fluid um, into, the pleura, and into, the, um, into the needle itself. Here's an example of the vessels that you can see. Again, you try to avoid them. If you have an ultrasound probe, you can try to visualize them with, um, with um, you could try to visualize them. Sometimes you can see them. And again, you could try to avoid them, but you're just as likely to get um, a, a, anywhere in the intercostal space. And this is an example. Here you can see the, the vessels, but this is the rib itself. And it's in this case, it's actually kind of in the middle. This is the other portion of the rib. Um, so the artery itself is actually right in the middle of the intercostal place, space. So abscess drainages we can do as well. Um, there's two forms of techniques. There's a, there's a Seldinger technique and there's a direct technique. The Seldinger technique actually involves putting a, um, a sheath into the collection, inserting a wire into the collection, and then serially dilating the track using uh, dilators and then actually putting the drain over it. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages. Um, I won't really go onto them, um, but um, again, there's different routes to consider when you're also doing abscess drains. And you have to consider the routes because certain routes result in a higher risk of um, seeding. So if you're going an intercostal route, you can seed the pleura and cause an empyema. If you're going a, a transhepatic approach, you can actually see the liver itself. Sometimes um, you should involve surgery prior to doing it and um, try to avoid draining necrotic masses. Sometimes masses with necrosis can be mistaken for abscesses on CT or ultrasound. So here's an unfortunate case of a large um, complex fluid collection here. You could see it along the anterior aspect of the right iliac wing. It's a large complex fluid collection. It was called an abscess. We ended up putting a grid. We put a introducer needle into the collection. We put a wire into the collection. And we um, eventually aspirated the collection. The collection almost resolved in its entirety. Unfortunately, the patient came back with this. And um, this is multiple collections now extending through all the way to the skin surface. Unfortunately, this was not an abscess. This was actually a mucinous tumor of the ovary that was inadvertently drained. And unfortunately, because it was drained, it actually seeded the entire um, you know, the remainder of all the way, the abdominal cavity, the peritoneum, the subcutaneous tissues of the abdominal wall. So be careful about, um, you know, placing drains in lesions that are necrotic and particularly malignancies that are necrotic. Um, we'll talk a little bit about lung biopsies. Um, lung biopsies are important um, to establish a diagnosis. PET CTs are always helpful to determine um, not only determine if there's, you know, if the disease, if the lesion itself is FDG avid and high risk, also to determine where in the lesion we should biopsy, where would be the highest yield to actually position our needle. The risk of pneumothorax is substantial. So we should always talk to the patient and tell them that there's always a risk of leaving the biopsy room with the pneumothorax, and there's a risk of requiring a chest tube. Um, always look for easier sites. You'd be surprised at how many times I see biopsies, lung biopsies done. There are hard lung biopsies, but I end up looking and I'm like, well, there's a supraclavicular lymph node or, or liver metastasis. Why didn't we look at those? And those would not only allow histological diagnosis, but it would also stage the patient. And these are usually done by CT unless they're subplural and very large. We use a 19 gauge introducer, the introducer with a 20 gauge coaxial biopsy. Sometimes we do a fine needle aspiration as well using a 22 gauge needle. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about thermal ablation. And we, um, we do a lot of thermal ablation at Brown. Um, this is a spiculated mass that is, um, you know, multi-stable, um, sorry, a spiculated mass that is a lung cancer. You can see some background emphysema. We can actually insert an ablation probe and we can actually burn the lesion away um, under CT guidance. So here's an example of one that we did at Brown. You can see that um, the, over time, the patient develops this sort of thermal involution scar, but they're cured. They get to go home the same day. It's a minimally invasive approach. It's, um, it's very well tolerated. There are um, complications um, with thermal ablation. We can do it in any part of the body. We can do it in the liver, the kidney. We've done it in the bones. We've done it in the soft tissues. Um, RFA is, is, a, is a thermal ablation technology that results in damage to the cellular proteins and enzymes, and it creates tissue necrosis and coagulation. It uses sort of this alternating current um, that results in ionic agitation and friction and tissue heating. And we can actually measure the temperature at the conclusion of the procedure. And at the conclusion of the procedure, we like to see a temperature of 60 degrees in the tissue because the temperature of 60 degrees in the tissue means that cell death has occurred. And we can use different kinds of RFA systems to plan how many, uh, you know, how, you know, how aggressive we want to be depending on the size of the lesion and the, the margins that we're trying to achieve. This is the Kultis system um, from Covidian. You could use multiple probes. You can use a single probe, and each of them has, you know, obviously the more probes you use, the longer the exposure time, the larger your ablation zone. This is a Boston Scientific system that I showed earlier. It kind of uses this, this kind of, you know, hockey-shaped, um, you know, system where you can actually, um, it's a different kind of, um, it's, just, it's a more of a ovoid ablation zone, whereas this is more of a spherical ablation zone. So depending on the geometry of the lesion, you can choose the. Um, system that you want to use. Here's an example of the two systems side by side. Here's the RFA system, the cool tip system, which is more ovoid. And here's the Covidian system. So depending on, this is actually a real liver. And depending on, you know, how the lesion looks, you can, you can achieve different ablation zones. So again, 60 degrees is very bad for cancer. It, it results in instantaneous pro, uh, protein coagulation, instant cell death. Sustained temperatures of 40 to 60 are, um, or could result in, in, in good treatment response, but um, 60 is the ideal temperature. Um, so that's another example of coagulant necrosis. Um, so a lot of it depends on, you know, the probe that we use, the method of energy, the tissue properties, the sensitivity of the tissue to heat. Some, some tissues are more sensitive than others, and also heat loss from what we call a heat sink effect. If the mass is near a blood vessel, the blood vessel can theoretically carry the, the heat away. So we usually use a, um, to do the procedure, we use a large aliquot of alicane, lidocaine on the pleura or on the, um, you know, peritoneum. If you're doing a lung, you obviously put it on the pleura. We use conscious sedation. Um, we use deep injections of 22 gauge um, with a 22 gauge needle to the pleural surface. And then we insert the probe directly into the lesion. We can use an outer coaxial needle. We can biopsy it before and we can, we can, we can then insert the probe and burn it after the procedure. And here's an example of an FDG avid lesion. And you can see that over time, we've actually, um, you know, uh, we've turned it into a large air cavity. So, and there it is, um, followed up on PET scan. You can see barely any residual activity. Um, about two years later, there's a little bit of activity, which is just a little bit of residual scar. This is another procedure we do, cryoablation. We're using cold, we're using freezing to do it. This is a very um, labor intensive procedure. We have to use multiple probes. Um, we have to use gas. Um, it's a very um, time intensive procedure. We have to freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw. You just have to do multiple cycles of it. And this is an example of the ice ball forming that um, we can actually visualize with imaging. So here's a big mass. And um, here you can actually see the ice ball. This is what the ice ball looks during the procedure. We're actually imaging it. We can actually we can ensure that the ice ball does not go too far. So it's not going to damage like important structures like the heart. Microwave is like a nuclear bomb. It's the larger zone. It, it provides very high temperatures. It's less susceptible to heat, heat sink. It's quicker. Um, it's very, very powerful. So here's a large um, mass in the, uh, in, the, in the lung and we've actually used two microwave probes and it's like a, it's like a nuclear bomb. And this is an example of the new wave system that we use at Brown. This is a cool case done at Brown where we actually have a, a cancer here in the lung. It's in the right upper lobe medially. And um, if you know, remember your anatomy, the phrenic nerve actually runs very close to this area. You can see here, 
So what we actually did was we introduced a pneumothorax into the pleural space. And the reason we did that is the pneumothorax will actually separate the lung tissue from the, the um, phrenic nerve. Or, um, a transmitter of electricity and uh, heat. So because of that, we actually are protecting the phrenic nerve and therefore the patient will not um, experience diaphragmatic palsy. So I'm just going to show you um, uh, things can happen with RFA and this is an example of seating. We talked a little bit about a tumor that's seated into the abdominal wall after an RFA. Um, I'm going to end this discussion with pleurax catheters. Um, pleurax catheters are um, procedures that we can perform for um, refractory pleural effusions or refractory ascites. Um, these are patients who usually have malignant pleural effusions or malignant ascites. These are patients who uh, need recurrent paracentesis or thoracentesis. And the, um, the, the magic of this procedure is that we're using a tunneled catheter. And the tunneled catheter has this um, special um, this, um, this tubing, and the tubing actually gets tunneled through the abdominal wall, and there's a cuff. And the cuff actually causes the body to form, form a very tight scar around it, and therefore it decreases the risk of infection. So here's an example of the catheter itself. You can see the cuff here, and this cuff goes in the abdominal wall. It's a, it's a tunnel situation. So the cuff is in the abdominal wall, and it actually forms a nice big um, scar around it. So it's supposed to prevent infection or minimize the risk of infection. And again, these can be placed in the abdomen for ascites or in the chest for pleural effusions. And that's it. Sorry, I was having IT issues and I had to run through a little bit quickly, but my apologies. And um, here's my questions. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me. I'd be happy to answer them. You can always email me any questions or concerns. And again, here's the um, the link to the um, CME if you, if you need it. Thank you so very much, Dr. Siedler. That was really a, an excellent overview of almost all things interventional um, abdominal imaging and really gave a nice overview of so many different types of biopsies that you do. Um, we'll definitely have to have you back at some point. I'll give everybody a couple seconds here to write down the email. Um, and with that, thanks again to Dr. Siedler and to everybody who's been joining us this morning. We'll have the lecture available online, hopefully within a week or so. Okay, I'm going to end the session now. Take care, everybody, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much.